Hi guys, my name's Dane, and today I, I was doing my best Charlie impression. I don't know if that was any good. Today, in the latest installment of Tarden Dane's Indie Read Along, I'm going to be doing a quick review of Doris Ahoy by Charles Heathcote. So this is book number 2.5 in the R. Doris series. It's a novella. I believe Charlie wasn't orig originally going to you know, publish it as a standalone thing, but then it kind of grew to be long enough where it, it really deserved it. And I think it does work very well as a standalone novella. So I'm going to read you the blurb here. After recent traumatic events, Harold and Doris have embarked on a world cruise, hoping for rest and relaxation. Their plans are thwarted at every turn. There's the mystery surrounding the identity of Mrs. Veronica Ambrose, and a dance competition that pits the pair of them against regional champion and trifle guzzler Ken. Told from the perspective of long-suffering husband Harold, he dreams of being back home, nursing a pint down the hare and horse. Instead, he's propping up a smoothie bar with health and fitness freak Percy, a man with an unnatural interest in kale. Doris Ahoy is the third book in a series of monologues featuring Mrs. Doris Copeland and Partridge Muse. So if you've read any of these other books, you'll kind of know what you're in for here. Charlie's got like a very sort of northern British sense of humour. And it's very reminiscent of, say, keeping up appearances, something like that. Doris is very obsessed with, like, her social standing. And Harold, you know, he just wants to chill out and go to his allotment. So um, I'm going to go through and check some of my flags here. So I think the opening paragraph here does a great job of recapping, like, who uh, Doris is as a character. And actually, I think you could probably read this novella without reading the others. I mean, you'll get more if you read out of the, the if you read the series in order. But I think really you probably could eat, read each of them as standalones. But anyway, opening paragraph: Our Doris gets some sort of malicious glee out of making me wear a tie to breakfast. All the other husbands get away with polo shirts. Cyril Marsden even got away with pajamas when his Betty ate a bad scallop in Sardinia. I, however, have to wear a shirt and tie. Our Doris has my outfits planned out for the entire cruise, right down to my socks. It doesn't matter that we'll never see our fellow passengers again once the cruise is over. Our Doris says we must strive to leave a lasting impression. So that's the kind of person that Doris is. I should point out as well, I'm currently working with Charlie. I'm uh, ed editing his uh, secret project, so I can't really tell you anything about it. But it was interesting because I've been editing it while reading this book. And uh, they have similarities, but they also have differences. So it was interesting to do the two at the same time, you know. I like this bit here as well. So we learn like Doris had a bit of a crisis. So uh, before we came on the cruise, she started to let me read the Daily Mirror in public. We had Chinese takeaway three times in four weeks and she said nothing when I offended her cousin Mavis. It never quite came to the point that she needed to listen to rock music, but it came close enough that I hid her meatloaf CDs. There's only so many times a man can hear I would do anything for love before he begins to question whether he actually would. We have this reference here to natural yoghurt as well, and I think I can say this, that there was also a reference to natural yoghurt in this secret project as well. So we have here, uh, we're talking about Percy here, the guy that was in the blurb. He's an alright lad, 57 years old with all his own teeth and a head full of hair. He's in better shape than I was at his age, which might have something to do with him going to the gym five times a week, and that he bypasses every offer of bacon in favour of natural yoghurt. I've no idea why, since the only benefit I've found from natural yoghurt is it takes the heat out of chicken tikka masala. I like this little uh, interaction here we have as well, so I guess Ken is kind of one of the antagonists of the book. I must say I understand your puzzlement entirely. Is this about Ken? Am I right in believing you made a rather barbed comment in reference to his ever-expanding waistline? I must admit I stared at her all agog. I planned to spend the afternoon watching Guardians of the Galaxy whilst our Doris went to the spa, and now I was stuck in bed with our Doris educating me on the correct way to address an overweight OAP. I said to her, I said, I might have joked about the gut on him, but that's all it were. Men take the mick out of each other, our Doris. It's part of being a man. One day I get one in about his weight, the next he's mocking my ability to play cards. Yes, well, your, pit your pitiful poker face aside, I'm afraid it just isn't the thing anymore. What isn't? Joking. Specifically jokes about a person's weight. In a multicultural, multi-gendered society, we must be accepting of people of all shapes and sizes. And whilst jokes regarding weight have always been commonplace, they have been made without consideration of the inner turmoil, or lack thereof, of people struggling, or not, with their weight. Therefore, you'd have been better off saying nothing about Ken's weight. For whilst he laughed at the time, he was actually hiding years worth of pain. I like this conversation between Harold and Percy as well. I said to him, I said, I have all my own teeth. You have dentures, he said. I paid for them, didn't I? I like this little line as well, because it's, it's very accurate. 
I swear when I went in for my knee operation, they changed half the cast of Emmerdale. So Emmerdale is a soap opera and my mum watches it. And so I tend to catch it every time I'm in Tamworth. And every time I see it, I'm like, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? I like this little conversation here as well, especially because like sex between older people, it isn't usually in books. And so it was nice to see represented, you know, and it was tastefully done as well. Does this mean you're my friend again, Ardaris? No, Harold, it doesn't. I'm not your friend, I'm your wife. I can't pretend I wasn't disheartened. I said, does being my wife mean you can't be my friend? Listen to me, Harold Copeland. Alf is your friend. To some extent, Percy is your friend. I should hope you don't do with them what you do with me. I said to her, I said, and what's that? Close the curtains and you'll find out. There it was, the blue bottle in my chest, that familiar blush to our Doris's cheeks as she locked the door. I never anticipated getting up to mischief on the high seas, but we made mincemeat of those hospital corners. Oh, okay, so I like this as well. So Theo ends up on board the ship, and Theo is their grand, uh, their grandson. So we have this little bit here. Before she could continue and tell us all about the social consequences of consuming too much milk in public, I said to Theo, I said, how did the exams go? He came over all melancholy. A shadow settled over his face like Anne Widdicombe in front of a vending machine. He said to us, he said, Without my grandparents around to guide me, I could not muster the requisite mental strength to attend. Instead, I spent my days lingering outside off licenses, waiting for disreputable old people to go past, who had asked to buy me cheap cider and cigarettes. I became close friends with Janice Dooley of Little Street. My heart fell into my stomach. I glanced from Theo to our Doris, whose face had fallen, her jowls as sad as bulldogs. She looked all set to cry again. Until Theo burst out laughing. The guffaws came straight from the stomach. He clapped his hands on the table. Whichever one of us he looked at sent him further into a fit of hysteria. You should see your faces, he said. Lord, you're important to me, but I didn't miss you enough to throw my life away. Did you honestly believe mum would let me come on this trip if I did that? This bit made me laugh as well. Like It just made me, you just heard my reaction to just seeing it there again. It's this last little bit, but I need to read a bit more to give you some context. It turns out I couldn't do a lot. Despite the fact I've been prescribed strong painkillers, I could barely walk, let alone waltz. Our Theo let me off the morning run reluctantly. He didn't believe there was anything wrong with me. Looked at me in that way mothers look at sons trying to get out of doing the dishes. But he soon realised there was something wrong when I sprawled out on the dance floor and told him to leave me there to die. <laughs> we have another great exchange here as well. The day passed in a haze of solemn disappointment. Our Doris and Theo had their last training session and whilst they were gadding about the ballroom I beggared off with Percy to the bar. I categorically refused to buy him a lime and soda and forced a pint of lager onto him. He said to me, he said, my body is a temple, Harry. I said, I and mine's a brewery. Drink up. And then there's this touching moment at the end. Like, uh, Charlie's really good at these. This has kind of happened with each of the books where at the end of them, uh, there's been like a really sweet exchange between Doris and Harold. So I know we set out to beat Ken and Sheila. And since there's no chance of that happening now, I don't mind saying this. When I thought we were going to dance together again, I felt like I had something to look forward to for the first time in a long while. It also meant us getting to show everyone what we mean to each other. Because despite the fact you read the Daily Mirror, have a misogynistic interest in female gardening personalities of the 1990s, and never put your dentures away properly, you mean the world to me, R. Harold, and I want to make sure you know knew it. Apparently, grown men don't just cry at lumbago and football, because listening to our Doris's words had tears catching at my eyes. They could have been emotional, or the glare from our Doris's dress. Either way, she lent me her handkerchief. I said to her, I said, I thought you didn't go in for overt displays of affection, R. Doris. She found a smile and said, I shouldn't get used to it, R. Harold. It'll be a side effect of the sea air. I said, feeling just like I did when I asked her to the pictures for the first time, I said, Will you dance for me, R. Doris? I'll have to check my dance card. And then uh, I think you'll just, you guys will like this as well. This is in the, in the acknowledgements at the end. I would like to express my gratitude to the many booktubers who have read and reviewed my books over the last few years. You have helped introduce our Doris to readers all over the world, and this has warmed my heart on many an occasion. Well, hopefully this warmed your heart some more, Charlie. Rating time, I gave this a 4.25 out of 5. I just think this entire series is a must-read. Charlie is one of the most talented indie writers out there. And, uh, yeah, just, yeah, read it. So there you have it, that's what I thought of Doris Ahoy by Charles Heathcote. As always, let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.